And you can be turning your Bibles to to John 5. John 5. Folks, it is good to be back. It is good to be home. I am so tired of traveling. Um, It seems like the last five months of my life, I'm on a plane, I'm in a car, planes, trains, and airplanes, and and, uh, trains. Ain't that what's called? Planes, trains, and cars, or whatever. That's... I'm so confused, I don't even know how to say it right. But it's good to be home. You know, this time last year, I was in South Carolina. It's amazing what can happen in one year. In one year. I was living 1,600 miles away, and, uh, you know, now I'm in a new state, a new town, a new community. I'm in a new loving church, and... um, It's just exciting to be here. This morning, I want to talk to you about healing. Do you want to be healed? And uh, now I'm not talking about I'm going to have people come forward and we're going to pop them on the head and you're going to fall back and and do your dance or anything. I'm not talking about that. So don't let that scare you. We're not going back to Costal just yet. But here's the thing. Do you want to be healed? And and, and let me say it this way. The other day, I was at the uh, airport. Does anyone get... You just terrified when you give them that luggage. You just ter- they give you a tag like that gives you a confidence. This magical tag is going to get your luggage back to you. And, and I'm always the one standing at the gate, waiting at the luggage gate, waiting for my luggage to come out. And it's always the last one. And you just see this luggage go round and around and around. And you start wondering, like, this guy belonged to somebody. Somebody got this. Matter of fact, it's just, it's just luggage and just a little, video, uh, a little visual. It's just laying there, going around and around. It's a really boring show. You know, there's not a lot to do. And, but what's fun, instead of looking at the luggage, look at the people. Because you sit there and, like, and And every time their luggage comes out this little gate, but it's not their luggage, you're like, <gasps> and they're like, it's not going to come. It's not going to come. My luggage is not going to come. Now, I've been there. I just assume my luggage is never going to make it. That's why I always take travel luggage. I don't care if I'm going, when I went to Europe, I took travel luggage. You know, I mean, for people are like, you got all that in that bag? Yeah, because I'm not going to give them my luggage. But I went with my wife. And you can't go on a trip with an overnight bag with your wife. You've got to have, you've got to have a house. I mean, we took everything but the sink. <laughs> but my luggage finally came and it really was the last piece. But here's the thing. There's always that one piece of luggage that never gets claimed. It just keeps going around and around. It belongs to somebody. But nobody wants to claim it. And it made me sit there and think this past week as I was waiting for eternity to end and get my luggage. I wonder how many of us today, we've gotten that old lost luggage, we've got that old luggage, that old baggage we just carry around with us. We know what's there. And we know it belongs to us. And it seems like no matter how far we get in life, no matter how far we make it, whether it be through success, whether it be through age or whatever it may be, no matter how far we get, that luggage is there. It's always in the back of our head. And what's scary about that luggage is every now and then it pops up and it makes us claim it in front of everyone. Maybe it's hate. Maybe it's hurt. Maybe it's shame. Maybe it's guilt. You see, all that luggage has a name. All my luggage... Um, has my name tag on it, you see. Or I find the ugliest piece of cloth or bandana or whatever, it is so ugly that nobody in the world would ever touch it. And that's what I tie around the handle of my luggage. Because I'm like, because everyone has black, okay, luggage. And so I have this ugly little piece of of cloth. You know, and and it says, that is mine. And that's the kind of luggage we have to deal with. It comes up and we can't deny it. You see, I believe there's some of us, much like the man we're going to talk about today, we've been carrying this luggage for a long time. And it just steals our joy. It steals our hope. You know what's awesome about seeing a young man like Gabriel come to know Christ and make it public like he did today? Is he 
lives the rest of his life with Jesus walking with him. And he doesn't have to walk around with ugly old luggage. For some of us, it came a little bit late in life. And for some of us, we accepted Christ, but yet we made some mistakes along the way. Folks, I'm talking about the luggage that you wouldn't tell me or anyone. The only the luggage that you share with Christ. Say, oh, Father, please forgive me. But we can't forgive ourselves. You see, I have a really exciting vision. God's finally starting to put the pieces together for me as your pastor about which directions we're going to go and some things that we're going to do. But folks, and, and, and it's going to excite you. But for us to really be what God would have us to be, we need to claim that luggage and then let God deal with it. We could leave it here today and never deal with it again. Maybe it's just the luggage of sin. Then our text today, we see that Jesus comes along and he sees a man that's been de- dealing with um, an issue for his life for 38 years. He's a paralytic. Matter of fact, he's surrounded by a lot of people that have some issues. So with that being said, <clears throat> let's read our text. John 5 verses 2 through 9. John 5, verses 2 through 9. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? This sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he looked up and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to come this morning. And Lord, though I'm unworthy to share your word, Father, I thank you for the spirit that resides in my heart to do just that. Father, I thank you for the forgiveness of sin. I thank you, Lord, for the power of victory. Lord, I thank you for the gift of hope and joy that comes through salvation. Father, I thank you, Lord, that we were able to come this morning and share with Gabriel and his family and this awesome public testimony before the world. But Father, we come to a point where your word is taught, Lord, where it encourages us, Lord, where it convicts us. So Father, I pray this morning that we would learn from your word. Father, that when it comes time to do whatever needs to be done, Lord, that we would be obedient. Lord, the Holy Spirit has freedom to do what needs to be done this morning amongst each and every one of us. Father, let not us worry about tomorrow or what happened this past uh, week or year, but God, let us look forward to the new year. And Father, let us do so by letting go of unclaimed baggage. Father, you can deal with all sin, guilt, shame, and hurt. Father, let us recognize that you are the healer of our hearts. So, Father, as I most often say, Lord, forgive me my sins, Lord. I pray that I would be nothing but a broken vessel restored only through the power of your spirit to preach and to share your word. And, Lord, I pray that you would move amongst us. And, Lord, let 2015 start with a revival in our heart. In Jesus' name, all God's children say, amen. The first thing I want you to understand this morning is the condition. The condition that we're looking at. It says, now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five Ruth colonnades. In these lay the multitudes of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Now here we see that there's a lot of people laying here and they're all in hurts. Every one of them need a touch. And, and some of you this morning, if you're not familiar with the text, well, why would they lay around this pool? Well, it was said that every now and then an angel would come from heaven and that that angel's wings would barely touch the top of that pool and that the pool would ripple. And that if you saw the pool ripple because of the angel touching the wing, the first one in the pool would be healed of any infirmity they had. 
So here you have this, what would be called a miracle pool, and, and all these people just laying there praying that an angel would touch the water. Now, we don't know if that's true or not, but they believed it. So, so Jesus comes walking along, and imagine, now Jesus is a pretty busy person. He's got a lot going on, but he notices the multitudes. Much like we see many today. You see, a lot of us fall into that condition. It says here, in this condition for a long time. There's been a lot of us, we've been in a condition for a long time. Maybe, maybe we've had hurt, guilt, or shame. Maybe it's an unforgiving spirit, but we've had that for a long time. We could forgive a murderer, but we couldn't forgive our own brother or sister. We can forgive someone for stealing our car, but yet we're still holding a grudge against someone taking our shirt when we're a teenager, and it was our shirt, and we didn't want to share it. Whatever silly thing it may be. Or maybe it was a big thing. But yet it's amazing how we can look into the world and say we can forgive this group and this group and this group, but yet we can't forgive those that we know best. Maybe it's a physical ailment. Maybe we're mad at God. I wasn't supposed to be this way. I, I'm at an age where I was supposed to be able to travel and to see the world and to do your things. Why is my health like this? God, I'm mad at you that I'm like this. My father had to deal with that very issue. We sat there one night and, and I said, Dad, what, what's the matter? He said, he said son, I, I'm 65 years old. Me and your mom were supposed to travel. Me and your mom were supposed to go see the world. We, we, we worked so hard to put you and the boys and take care of you. But our dream was when we got to this certain age that we would, we would just lock up the house and travel the world, get an RV and travel. And my dad said, look at me, son. I'm in a wheelchair. Son, I can't even go to the bathroom without help. I'm not a man. I wish I would just die. God has cursed me. You know what that does to a son? Tears father taught like that. I said, Dad, don't blame God for the ailments of the body. It won't be long and you'll be going on the journey of a lifetime. And it wasn't long a year later. You see, folks, I, I, I don't know the name of your luggage. Maybe you're, this here, maybe you're here this morning and you don't even know Jesus Christ. Maybe your luggage is just sin. Unconfessed sin. Sin that keeps you from walking with God. You know, we live in a sick world and that world says, you can't love Jesus. You, you can't have a personal relationship with God. But his word says you can. And yet we want to believe the world over God's word. And God says, I'll forgive you of that sin. He says, I know your condition. I know. Look, he says, I, he, he said, I, it looked like you've been there a long time. He says, look, just like this little piece of luggage, I know what you carry. I know what you need. You see, Jesus knows the condition. I've got this way. Those memories of resentment. We feel we have those no good feelings. We have the baggage in our life that Jesus keeps replaying and replaying. Every time we feel like God gets us somewhere, that old devil comes back and says, Whoa, don't forget about that piece over in the back. You don't want no one to know about that. And instead of stepping up and being the husband and the wife and the sons and the daughters and the men and women of God that he's called us to be, we shrunk our shoulders and go back because we're like, surely God could never forgive me for that piece of luggage. Surely God could never use me. And we waste years and years of our life in the condition of defeat. But you see, there's one that cares. There's one that has a heart. And that's Jesus. Who cares? I put it this way. Who really thinks you matter? Well, Jesus does. It tells us so. 
But look what the scripture says. It says, when Jesus saw him laying there and knew that he had been ready, that he had already been there for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? Now, I want to look at a word that's very easy to read, but very, very, it's overlooked. The very simple word of saw. It says Jesus saw him. Jesus took notice. He literally walked by and said, I saw this man and and, and I I noticed him and my heart was compelled. And you say, Pastor, why why is that such a big deal? Jesus was surrounded by many. Jesus had a lot of people looking at him and, and, and coming to him and they were at him. And yet through all the chaos and all that was taking place, Jesus still noticed a man in need. Pastor, why is that important to us today? Because there's some of us in this place today, we've actually believed a lie. Well, Jesus is too big. He's sitting on the throne. He's got too much going on. Jesus can't notice me in my life, but he does. He sees you. He sees the hurt. He sees the condition. You see, Christ loves you. It tells us in Romans 5.8. God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He sees where you are today. He sees what you're dealing with. Folks, I'm telling you, you can walk out of this place today a different person. You don't have to walk out with a defeated mentality, a hopeless attitude. You can walk out knowing that God's dealt with you personally. Because he has a heart. Because he knows what our need is. Now it's interesting. You say, well, pastor, what if, what, if, what if I just come to you and talk to you? It's not enough. You know, there's a lot out there that say, well, I'll go talk to the pastor or whatever religious title they have that's in charge. You don't come to me. Matter of fact, I, I wrote it this way. When Jesus took to heal this man... It wasn't the disciples, the priests, the temple, the believers, the music. It wasn't the church ministries. You see, Jesus healed this man. But it wasn't anyone but Jesus. Where are you at today? What are you dealing with? You see, it comes to this. It's the power of God that makes the difference. It's the power of God. Look what it says. Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. Here we have Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He he sees everything that's going on and he stops for one moment and he goes to this individual and says, do you want to be healed? And he heals him. But what did the man say? When Jesus said, do you want to be healed? What did he say? Did he say yes? No. He did what many of us are going to do today. He gave an excuse. Well, I'd like to be healed, but I just can't get in the water. Someone always gets in before me. Someone's always better at it than me. Someone always has something better than I do. I just can't do it. Oh, it's not that I don't want to be healed. I do. But you know what? I just can't. You see, it was a simple yes or no question, but he gave an excuse. And in just a moment, I'm going to ask you, do you want to be healed from the baggage and the hurt and the shame and the guilt or whatever your burden is in life? And me was going to say, oh, I I can't. I, I can't. I've carried it so long. Matter of fact, some of us enjoy playing the victim. And I know that's hard to believe. But we like playing the victim. We like saying, well, I can't sing good enough. I, I, I don't know how to build. Folks, I, I can't even glue toothpicks together and get them straight. But I go on mission trips. I, I, I can't sing, but poor old Ira has to listen to me sing right there. And he, I don't know how he keeps smiling. He says, well, and, I, oh, and everybody's like, oh, that's so good. And Ira's like, oh, my goodness, preacher, please stop. I would be embarrassed if they turned the mic on when I'm singing. I still sing. You see, the power of God can change people. The power of God can do anything. 
Jesus, notice here, Jesus didn't get up and, and say, well, let's, let's talk about this. and Maybe I can do something. Jesus just looked down in front and said, just, just get up and walk. It's that simple. Surely, pastor, it can't be that simple. It's that simple. Well, surely there's, there's procedures I must go through. Surely there's something I must do. What did the scripture say the man had to do? What did Jesus ask him to do? Simply answer a question. Do you want to be healed? You see, there's people in this place today. I guarantee it. You, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Just like little Gabriel just did a minute ago. And it's going to grow up and be a fine, outstanding man of God. And you say, well, uh, it's so simple for children. Is that simple for you? Do you want salvation? Do you want Jesus? Do you want healing? Then let the power of God give it. Well, pastor, do I have to go to classes? Do I have to? <laughs> you just accept it. You can't earn it. What can you give the creator of the universe that he can't have on his very own? Well, surely I must give uh, my monies and my talents. You know, when Jesus comes to your heart, you just do that anyway. Because you love him and you're grateful. There's only one gift you can give God that he can't take. And that's your heart. That's the only thing you have to offer. Not streets of gold. Not pearly gates. Not saying you went to church every day of your life. But your heart. That's all it takes. If you go on, it says that that man got up and folks, it caused a big stir. If you go on and study that text, it's amazing. Some people weren't happy that Jesus healed a man. And there's going to be some people in your life because there's some of us making excuses. Well, if I really got right with Jesus, if I really got things right, why it, it might offend some people. Well, yeah, it is. But are those people really concerned about your relationship with Jesus or not? It is. There's going to be some people that aren't happy about the fact that you choose love and righteousness and salvation over sin, guilt, and shame. Because misery truly does love company. But you know what? If you go on and, and, and we're going to look at that text at a later date, he stands up in front of everyone and says, look, along with many others, Jesus changed my life. And I'll never deny it. Folks, Jesus Christ changed this little short fat dude a long time ago. I couldn't deny it if I wanted to. And here's the truth. I had some baggage. I had some stuff I didn't want to own up to. And I did just like I'm going to ask you to do. Would you claim it and give it to Jesus and let him take care of it? I wonder how many people in this room, you've walked around with something in that luggage for years and years, just like that man for 38 years, and you just can't let it go. And you can't serve God and be the servant and do all the things you want to do that your heart is desiring to do because you still hold on to that one piece that holds you back. Let it go. I ask you this question. Go ahead and pop up the last one. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? You see, you have to answer that question. Do you want to be healed? For some of us today, do you, do you want Jesus Christ? Not religion. Religion sends you to the pit of hell. Did you know that? Hell's going to be filled with religious people. People that went through all these little, little things that the world said they had to do. And they said, well, surely I'm good enough. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. It's about just, it's, hey, it's like this. Your father, Gabriel, keeps leaning over and touching you on the leg and he's loving on you. You see, that's what daddies do. They love on you. 
I do that to my boys. You see, no matter how bad my boys mess up, they get daddy's love. They don't have to do anything. Now, truly, they get a little bit better Christmas when they do act right. <laughs> they didn't get a very good Christmas. Anyway, um, no, I'm kidding. They're all right. <laughs> we went to grandma's. You know that ain't true. But my boys get it no matter what. Why? Because we're in a relationship. Are you in a relationship? Are you in a relationship? Not religion. Do you want to be healed today? This morning, I want to give you an opportunity. Maybe when those musicians come forward, let me say this. Maybe this morning, you just need to come down at the very first Sunday in 2015 and let go of some baggage. Just fall down on your knees and let go of some baggage. Just let it go. Oh, but pastor, I've carried it so long. Just, just let it go. But pastor, my, my, matter of fact, my heart arms have gotten used to carrying it. Let it go. They'll be strong enough to carry something else now. Let it go. Oh, but pastor, you don't know what I did. I don't, but Jesus does. Let it go. Maybe this morning you need to step out and come down and say for the first time in my life, I want Jesus. I'm tired of trying to live up to what everyone else thinks and what everyone else says and what the world thinks. I just want Jesus. See, you can't earn your way into heaven. But you can ask for forgiveness and accept the gift of salvation for all eternity. But it's up to you. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, I love you. And Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come. And Lord, I pray, Father, that you would move amongst the hearts and lives of every individual in this place. Father, right now, you're beckoning some to come forward and just fall down on their knees in front of their friends and their family. And Lord, just do business with you. Lord, the, the word doesn't say they have to come to me. The word teaches that they come to you on bended knee. So Father, I pray that if the Holy Spirit's moving, Lord, that they would be obedient. Every eye closed, no one's looking around. Some people would say, Pastor, and I've said this many times, why, why do I have to get up and move? There's just something about stepping out and moving forward and bowing down in front of your brothers and sisters in Christ and talking to your Father in heaven and getting things right. And if you've never done it, it's hard to explain. But when you get up, you feel the pressures of the world come off and you feel like, wow, Jesus is with me. And if you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would love to introduce you to my Father and Him become yours. I would love for you to this day say, I want Jesus. I want salvation.